This is Jesse Hensley. And this is Josh Turner. Welcome to Turn Down for What. Welcome back to Turn Down for What. I am Jesse, and on the phone, our special guest today is Josh. He is coming in from another location because he is quite under the weather. Hello, Josh. I'm here. No, hell, not really, but kind of. So, uh, <laughs> uh, at least you're here. At least you're here. So, how has things been going? I'm one day at a time trying to get over this crud. Yeah, I think everybody has that wonderful crud going on. So, um, a little bit different today. We probably won't have a guest appearance other than Josh on the phone, uh, but we do have a boatload of news uh, over the last week, as well as uh, our automotive spotlight today is going to go towards Lotus. Now, Lotus is uh, a car maker that's coming out with their EV versions. Um, always loved the Lotus Lease. A very lightweight car, um, wonderful uh, uh, sports cars that they've made in the past. So we'll get into that here in a minute. But on the news part of it, let's go ahead and start out with what uh, Morgan Stanley has been talking about. So Tesla was in the news with their Dojo supercomputer. Now, uh, for those that you don't know, the Tesla has been making noise about going into the data services as well as some of their supercomputers. And um, I think they're also going to be going into building their own systems, their own backdoor systems, everything that is part of uh, a data center. They're going to build everything themselves because that's kind of how they like doing things. So out of one of those, they were talking about their supercomputer and how it could, uh, uh, what its value would be in the EV sector. And of course, Morgan Stanley came out earlier uh, this week and said, yeah, it's probably going to add $600 billion to that sector because now you're going to have the ability for robo taxis. You're going to have the uh, ability for software services. And again, it just goes into the uh, reason why Tesla is so highly valued uh, from its stock standpoint is because it is not necessarily a car company, but a technology company. And I think that, uh, you know, this is another direction that other car companies, uh, again, we talked about that last week, Josh, where, or a couple of weeks ago, where Ford is making a investment into the same area. So it makes you wonder, are other car companies going to be going into the data services as well for their EVs or even their current car fleets? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <Yep. laughs> okay. I'll let you talk about Honda. Yeah, so it looks like Honda is going to be actually looking at adopting the Mac system. Um, what's interesting is Honda hasn't had a gigantic force in the um, EV space. I think that they're up and coming, um, but something that they are saying that on the EV model that they have, and that they're going to be announcing starting in 2025, um, it looks like they're going to be using that Max uh, charging port following all of the other dealerships, or OEMs, that is, that have actually um, switched over to that system. So just another dealership falling in line um, down that vein, providing another, another, another person kind of headed that direction. And, um, you know, obviously it just shows that the, there's a general movement towards that system being a lighter weight and smaller system. It just, you know, it, I'm surprised, you know, it, wow. it's, oh, everybody is transitioning and I'm curious, you know, which what the, the ones that have not transitioned when, when those announcements will come. Yeah, because I mean, I think by now everybody... All the major car companies, for the most part, have said we're going to be using the NACS. Now, the question is, who isn't going to be using NACS? And if you have a lot of NACS uh, um, connectors out there and you don't have that system, you're going to be limiting where you can charge your vehicle. Um, so I hate the fact you may have to have a CSS and a NACS. I mean, that's kind of like having a lightning port and a, uh, USB C port on the same phone, which has never happened, you know? So, uh, that transition eventually is going to happen. It's just who's going to win. And right now it seems like NACS is going to be the winner in that just because of everybody that's going over to that. So, um, now, I might be wrong, but am I correct in saying that I don't believe that Honda actually currently has an EV on the market. They only have their hybrids. Am I correct? I think they have plug-in hybrids, don't they? I don't even know if they have even that. I know that they have announced their prologue coming in 2024, 
that's going to be the. I think that's their first EV is the 24 Honda Prologue. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm curious. I mean, obviously Honda, you know, has. I think they missed the opportunity to use the term the the term payload or, or the. That's the prologue. I guess the prelude was the the one that would have been before that. Obviously, <laughs> <laughs> I liked the Honda Prelude. It was a very nice car. So yeah, I, mean, I, I just pulled up their website, and it looks like if you go to their vehicles. Um, their current, what they that what they label as electrified, is the CRV hybrid, um, and the Honda Accord hybrid, um, but they don't actually have an electrified. Um, I don't think they have any full EVs or even plug-in hybrids. So it'd be curious to see. I mean, obviously they're going to drop the Prologue um, next year. It looks like I mean they're probably about to start taking orders and stuff on that. Um, but then, you know, the year following, always something that will be transitioned over. And that's, you know, obviously be interesting to see kind of what, what that ends up producing. I would love to see a little uh, Honda K car that's done up that way. They they had so many great K cars. That little convertible that came out in the 90s is weird, and I love it too. So It's you a would... 2024. It's a mid-size SUV like the other Pro Lump, but I'm not seeing much information as far as range. And things go, so I don't even know. We need to. We'll, we'll do a. We'll do a search on that one. Let's on. let's do a deep dive. See if we can talk to some people at Honda and uh, see where they're at with it. Because out of every, all of the car companies we've been talking about, uh, I don't think we've mentioned Honda that much in the past. So well, that's because Honda really doesn't have that much. We, we we mentioned that Toyota, which I mean, if you think about it, Honda and Toyota kind of have fallen in the same vein. Toyota has really specialized down in the hybrid space. I think that they're a little bit further along with some of the EVs, but a lot of what they've done is really perfected the hybrids. Um, I'm looking right now to see how many models they have that are full EV. Um, I think I think honestly, it's it's the same way with with them as far as um, they they have a ton of hybrid options because Toyota's really um, perfected the art of the hybrid. I mean. Their vehicles compared to other vehicles are far and above when it comes to the hybrid systems. I mean, I was, uh, I, and, and I love hybrid. I mean, Hondas. So we had a pilot that we just basically wore out. I think we had 180,000 miles from new. Um, loved that vehicle. We had a Honda Accord before that. So um, obviously, my mom purchased and, and it has had some Toyotas it, it, intermittent with a lot of the Fords that we've had as well. Uh, so. You know, they're a great car company. They're they're quite a large car company. I mean, when you start looking at the investment that they can make, they're about, what, a $60 billion company, I think. So it's not like they are, um, uh, you know, not utilizing their resources to go into this market. I think they're kind of like Toyota that said, look, we're, we're really not sold on that. I think that the hybrid is the best way to go. But, you know, now with all the sales that's going on with Tesla, it's, it's almost – playing catch up and and that kind of would go into our uh our next um we can kind of go back and forth with this with our next um uh news item which is last week we were talking about the cost of these vehicles and how uh, a lot of the ones from uh china are much cheaper than say the european counterparts and we're talking about model threes uh one thing i didn't realize is you could get the model three real world drive only which hasn't came out yet um Again, I'm not sure if this is on their website or not. This is on some blogs and some other things, but it looks like twenty nine thousand seven hundred and forty dollars is what the rear wheel drive um, uh, Model Three would be. So then you add the seventy five hundred dollar rebate on top of that. You know, now you're looking at what twenty two five for uh, an EV, and then they have the Model Two, which you know again hasn't been announced. It's it's kind of out there as a Potential robo taxi is what they were talking about with the with the AI part of it, and you look at a starting price of twenty five thousand. Now you're looking at eighteen seventeen thousand five hundred dollars for a brand new vehicle, and you know we've not seen numbers like that for years, even in the ICE top vehicle. So um, I think that the I mean, where do you make money at a twenty five thousand dollar vehicle, especially with electric? I, I it's well, just, just for clarity on the Model 3, I, I had looked into this after we got off the air last podcast episode because I was curious. Tesla has 
some creative marketing when it comes to the pricing strategy of their uh, vehicles. Okay. And so if you go to Tesla's website and you pull up the Model 3, it basically says, hey, Model 3, 29740 but then there's the fine print with the little asterisk that says the price assumes the $7,500 tax credit uh, and okay. estimated gas savings of 3000 So wow, okay. that is the Model 3 rear-wheel drive is actually 40, a, a $40,000 car. But they're marketing it as a 29740 for the real wheel because of mm-hmm. the gas savings over three years mm-hmm. and the seventy five hundred dollars tax. Sneaky, credit. sneaky, sneaky. But that's why if you look at all of their vehicles, if you go to their website, um, okay. you know, uh, if you go to a Model X, uh, creative marketing. I mean, that's you know, I'm from sixty eight five ninety, but then uh, in the, the fine print after federal tax credit. So it's actually ten thousand dollars yeah. more than that. But yeah, I mean, it's that's 70, just seven seventy eight. The way they've strategized it still i mean honestly still cheap though but it's not not bad it's still not you know yeah an all electric you know an all electric model three um and to be able to have the you know a base tesla but you're paying you know in essence i mean gas savings i think that's the tax credit i understand why they would remove that but they get the gas estimated gas savings that's an interesting one yeah because i mean you look at me, I, how many miles was I going a week? 15, you know, well, there for a while I was going 1,100 miles a week back and forth to work. So how would my the gas, gas would shoot, I would have, you know, $20,000 in gas savings is, is right. <laughs> based on you know, that. So just, just think about a $40,000, you know, all, you know, all electric, you know, then, then all of a sudden after the tax credit, you're 33, 34, that's still, you know, in the realm of things rather, that's a lot more affordable, you know, for a new vehicle, that's kind of what you're going to expect. If you look at all the other gas equivalents for brand new cars, mm-hmm. that's, that's what you're going to expect. Well, and it puts that, uh, who, who we were talking about the other day, it puts the Kia in even more of an elite area because I think that Kia was 35000 for the base model with everything without anything else. It was in the 35 range. So that actually puts it probably is the most affordable. Now that only has a range of 225 miles, but me and you both know if we bought that for our around town vehicle, and that's what we used around here, you could make it work very easy at that mileage um, without much of a headache either. I wouldn't want to take it across country or across the state, but uh, if you're looking for a vehicle and you only run in town, then, and you have an ice or, or, or you know, a gas version of something that you could run on long distances, you don't want to have two vehicles, obviously. You don't want to have to have two insurance payments and all of this. But at least on the local level with that size and that cost, I could really see that as a, a, as a, a benefit. Yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, if you look at the realm of new vehicles across the market, you know, you're not buying a brand new vehicle pretty much for anything less than $30,000, period. And that's the little tiny ones. And so to get a Tesla, I have to rebate for thirty three for brand new with some of those extra amenities. I don't think that that's outside of the realm of possible. Yeah. Um, but that's just where, you know, obviously you got to find, um, you know, it, it is a consideration to, to have on top of everything else. Yeah. All right, I'm going to skip the next item and go to Chevy's um, truck or their Blazer now that they have and then come back to that next item. So um, 2024 Chevy Blazer EV is now available to order. Don't everybody rush out at once, but it's now available. So it uh, starts out at 56000 uh gets you 280,000 or 280 miles, 279 miles of range. Eh, not too impressive with that. It only has a 150 kilowatt charge rate. Uh, their higher end version, which is $61,000 starting, uh, gets you 320 mile range. So basically the same as our truck with, uh, you know, 10, 15,000 less. But I would, I feel like that's a little high for that particular vehicle because the Blazer is kind of a smaller SUV. 
Uh, so I don't yeah. think the size is there. I don't think the utility of it is there. But again, it is available now for those who who like that SUV. And there is not that many SUVs on the market that are in that price range. So I think they're hitting in a, a kind of a lower area. I think that would be kind of a competitor to the Model Y. Um, and it, and again, it looks you're using traditional body, traditional design. Uh, that looks very similar to the other ones, kind of like what, what Ford did with the F-150. Uh, but it is now available to order if you want that particular vehicle. Are you going to go out and get it, Josh? Uh, Didn't think so. My, All right. Model Y, Model y 45,330 mile range. Um, you know, this one, you know. Yeah, although, it's already 20,000 uh, high, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it just seems like price-wise they've, pushed it i mean obviously it depends on its actual sales but it seems like they may have pushed that one a little bit high compared to its competition obviously we have to look at the insides and things and see um, what type of amenities are provided but you know but even at that i'm I'm getting more am i a i I guess we need to come up with a term are we a range snob if it's not over 300 we're not going to care and we want seven thousand miles of range with a charge i guess i guess we're range snobs now because i see this and i'm thinking okay 330 would be the one i'd go with because that's part of the lower end that i would want for fifteen thousand dollars cheaper yeah (laughs) and you're looking at still sixty one thousand dollars for this one 15 grand on a model y if that's one, I, I don't know which one you quoted there. Uh, I mean, there's a big difference there in price. Um, yeah, I mean, 280 mile range for 56,000, and then like I said, you know, the Model Y, you know, is 36,000 plus uh, 10 <laughs> after the tax credit gas savings, so it's like 45 to 48,000. Yeah, so you're still uh, cheaper that, with that, the Model Y. 10, 10 grand cheaper, and it goes 330 mile range. I um, mean, now obviously the Model Y is not. Um, that one's not a full blown. I think SUV. they're in the same market, though. I mean, I would put them both yeah. in the same. They're both all wheel drive. You know, I'm sure you could do some things. I'm sure they would be very similar because, let's face it, that Blazer is not an off road monster. It's not a Jeep or anything like that. So, um, I don't. I, I would think you would put them. And, and how many people take their vehicles like that off road? Nobody will. So, is it going to go through slush? Is it going to go through uh, snow? Probably the same. So, what is that extra ten grand buying you? And really, I've not. If, if today, I'm still going to say that Tesla is probably the premium version of all the EVs that's out there because they've been doing it the longest. Their technology is probably further along. Everybody else probably is catching up, but on, from the autom- uh, automation side, from the design side, you know, I've never really liked to look at some of the looks of some of the uh, newer Teslas. But again, that's just personal preference everybody that i know that's had one you know i've not heard the negativity you know and there's a lot out there there's a lot of people talk about the build quality there's a lot of people talk about the the gaps and things like that and i'm sure with a brand new car company making brand new vehicles that's never done that before in that realm it's going to take several years to get as good as these other groups but as you you know update your factories and your procedures and you make so many of them you're eventually going to have that opportunity to kind of surpass. And I think in some areas they have. So I don't see the benefit of that extra ten or 15000 for less mileage. I, I just don't see it. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I agree with you. All right. So what I skipped was our last item today in the news section. Again, like I said, we had a lot of news this week. But it, it goes back to how, what are we going to do to keep this market going and is it sustainable by buying everything overseas can we keep uh, our supply chains in place with this because there's not a lot of these uh, materials out there and that kind of goes into two news announcements that happened this last week the first one is china's uh golton i guess sorry if that's incorrect uh they're going to build a two billion dollar ev plant in illinois it's going to be on 150 acres, and it's going to produce 2,600 new jobs for that area. Now, when you start looking at the size, 2,600 jobs, I mean, that's that's up there. That That's like, for most cities, that would support a city for like a 30,000, 40,000 city um, a population. This would be the anchor for your entire city. So, you know, how could a city that is in the Rust Belt look at this and go yeah we don't like that because it's where the company is based out of but yet 
how could you turn away those 2,600 jobs to people who desperately need jobs in anything, not just in the EV sector, which is getting subsidized, but in any way, you know, those are, so what, you know. My question, my question to you is why is China bringing jobs to the United States? My guess incentives, you know, we've, we're incentivizing a lot right now to build certain things. My guess is this EV battery plant is going to be connected to, you know, one of the three or four major automakers that's in America. So these batteries will be going into systems here. So my, now, now this is all a guess. I don't know anything about this project, but you don't want to ship something from California or from China to here. You can, I mean, we've, we've seen it. We've talked to battery uh, uh, people about our systems and, you know, the, from a cost standpoint, it's still cheaper to make it there and bring it here. But there's a lot of headache also that goes into it. So right now that you're incentivizing the development of those systems, it could be that that is what they're doing to kind of diversify, you know, what happens if some if there's some geopolitical issues and it cuts off that supply line from China. How are they still going to be able to supply batteries to car companies in America? So I think it might just be some diversification and some uh, and some geopolitical hedging against potential hazards down the road. Again, I have no clue, um, but they're throwing enough money out there right now to where if you are a battery company, I would be considering coming into America because of those reasons. And, um, yeah. you know, so I, I think that there, there's a lot of good opportunities there for people. Um, I know Ford was talking to a Chinese company about their battery tech as well. Um, Let's just face it, China, for the most part, is technologically a, ahead of where we are today in their battery production. They, they're, they are. So getting that here, you know, and, and building it here is something we don't have. They've also cornered most of the uh, minerals that are needed for these type of systems. So if they've cornered those minerals, that makes it easier for them to make it and uh, harder for us to make it. And that kind of would roll into our next item, which is uh, McDermott Caldera. Now, this is a caldera. You can see here on the screen the uh, the location of it. This is a caldera that's near, where is it, ne uh, um, Oregon and uh, Nevada. Big caldera volcano. And what they have found and announced over the last few days, and again, this is a research that's been going back for a while, is that there is a possibility that this site that is between Nevada and Oregon contains more than double of the concentration of lithium than every other major site combined. Well, the two largest sites combined. So this is being considered as the largest lithium deposit that's ever been found in the world. And it is in Nevada and in um, Oregon. And it's the way that the geology there has been able to create um, the needed conditions in order to get the lithium or the materials, the liquid, as you got runoff. That material that as it's running off and is pocketing and, and absorbing into the soils and the clays, you have to have the right clay for it. There's a lot of things that goes into the geology to create lithium pockets. But they believe that they have um, have the largest clay bed that will allow for at least a total of 20 to 40 million metric tons. And again, I, my past history is grading and demolition. So when I think of, you know, in, in my 22 years, our family's company doing grading and, and clay and moving dirt, we might have moved a million, yard, uh, a million tons just us. And this is 20 to 40 million metric tons. I mean, it's a huge amount of clay uh, lithium that can be uh, obtained through this. Obviously, it's in some very uh, sensitive areas, um, but it comes down to, well, if we mine it here, it's still going to be easier on the environment than where we're getting it today. Because just because we're getting it from somewhere else doesn't mean that that pollution is still going out into the world. It's still, you're still mining it. So if anybody's going to mine it, I think that the America companies will do it cleaner and better than anybody else. I, I really do feel that way about it. So if you care about the environment and you want to see EVs and these lithium batteries, you would want to have American companies do the 
extraction because we care more about it when we do it than other places around the world. And I think that's kind of the key is you can't have it both ways. You're going to have to extract it. And our practices are probably, now again, uh, this is always going to be open for debate, but our practices I feel like are probably have the most restrictions on what you can and can't do, which would mean that for every million tons excavated, you're going to have less of a environmental impact than that same amount, say in China or Russia or in Brazil. Um, just again, I have no clue if it is or not, but my feeling is that that is what would be the case. And uh, of course it's owned by lithium Nevada. Um, and uh, the Lithium Americas Corporation, they've been working on this for a while now. So, again, I think this is a great positive. Um, I know there's going to be people that don't want to mine it, but if they want to help the environment, we're going to have to have power some way. So, The question will be, um, you know, as we get away from some of those rare earth metals, you know, what's the, what's the future, but, you know, for what the current demand is, you know, is there the opportunity to harvest those type of things? But I'm curious to see where that takes us. Yeah, and, and, again, and, and I haven't, the one thing I'm very weak in is the development of solid state. When you develop a solid state, does it take more rare earth metals? Does it take more environmental impact to make a solid state versus a um, lithium ion or a lithium iron or a lithium phosphate? Um you know, what is the environmental footprint of that battery? And I think that's the other thing. When, when you look at this, everybody can find common ground. We want to be able to turn our power on at home. We want to drive our vehicle, whether it be gas or electric. And we want to do those things. And both sides agree, yes, we should be able to do that. So how do we get to that point? And we need to do it from a standpoint of looking at the environmental impact for, of each one of them and say, okay, if I'm going to be extracting things, is it better for us to extract that material if we have it here, create those jobs here, that way at least the economy stays running, or do we outsource all of it, let the pollution go somewhere else, and then we have to go in later and clean it up, or it still has a devastating well, I mean, effect on us? What they've done with, if you look at what they've done with gas, I mean, they'd rather, they'd rather buy gas from elsewhere than to harvest it here, mm -hmm. oil, that is. And so, I mean, I, I think that, you know, that's just a... Um, I'm out there growing my oil, you know. Let me throw my seed, my fertilizer out and get me some oil coming up. But you seen the with the pipelines and everything, I mean, it's a political... It's um, it's political because, I mean, again, it's, it's political we can pump oil. Will they, allow, will they allow, you know, on both sides, you know, will they allow um, that type of harvesting to be done in the United States or would they rather... Uh, you know, get that those materials from external. I see. Uh, in my mind, when you say that, I think of a bulldozer out there with a little rake on it, with a little harvest thing on top, grabbing all the lithium out of the ground. So, harvesting. Yeah, that's going to be the question. Um, can we drill oil here cleaner than what we're buying it for? Yes, I think that our systems in America. Uh, would, would allow us to get that oil. And then you're buying it from American-made companies. You're lowering the price internationally if we have our own supply, which does hurt some of our adversaries in the fact that most of their economies are based in oil. Um, some of our adversaries, not most, but some. So is that something that by doing it here, is that I think that the problem there is they don't want it here or there. You know, that's that's the key. It, it From an, a pure environmental standpoint, you don't want any oil to be um, drilled for or used. The problem with that is you have to. Right now, for a long time, we're going to have to have that while we make a transition, if we can make that transition. There's a lot of people saying that there's not enough materials, um, and there won't be enough materials if we can't do our own mining in a way that will also protect the environment because obviously we won't be able to mine it if it does harm the environment. We've, we've made a lot of bad decisions in the past by, you know, not following safety regulations and then having huge, huge multi-million dollar and billion dollar sites that need to be cleaned up with heavy metals and, and 
um, a lot of toxic chemicals. That's happened plenty of times in our past. So this is where we can like kind of look at our history and say, okay, if we're going to do this. How can we do it effectively? And what is the impact of doing it here? And does it offset the carbon that we're trying to offset? Because that's what they're trying. That's what the environmental uh, uh, conversation is: is how do we reduce the carbon footprint? And if mining it here reduces that carbon footprint, then the end result would be not only jobs for Americans and and people within the United States, but it's also going to be a lower uh, carbon rate for the overall effect as having these EV vehicles. Very complicated and very, I guess, uh, uh, I guess the best way to, to describe it is there, there's always a viewpoint on both sides and it's hard to get on the middle of that one. But I think everybody wants to have power. Everybody wants to be able to drive. How can both sides kind of do that without trying to demonize the other side? So, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a discussion to have. But uh, something that, you know, the curious to see how that all that plays out. Yeah, we went in a weird di- direction with that one, just talking about having a big opportunity in western part of the states. So, um Anyway, so let's go to our vehicle. So this week we're talking about the Lotus. Uh, so this is going to take on the Porsche Cayenne, the Model S Plaid, and the uh, Lucid Air Sapphire. Um, it is the, what is that, the Emra? E-M-E-Y-A-S. So that would be Emrys. Emea. Emea. Anyway, it's dual motor, all-wheel yeah. drive. Yeah. <laughs> so... Um, 905 horsepower so it's got the power it's it's not as high as say the lucid air or the model s plaid but it is going to get a zero to 60 in 2.8 seconds you know that's a little uh in in today's numbers when you say i'm making a a very high-end model if i'm making the uh, flagship of my fleet i'm going to want to see sub two seconds i want to see 1.98 1.95 something like that just to get started so you know 2.8 if you're you're marketing a vehicle as you know or if if the if the claim is that it's going to be taking on the plaid and the sapphire and you're you better be able to beat the plaid or sapphire yeah i mean you're you're half over half a second behind you're almost three quarters of a second behind yeah, now really the Sapphire is a different price range too. The Sapphire goes is what two hundred and fifty thousand. Uh, the Model S Plaid we talked about is what right at ninety thousand. Yeah, I mean with the with the recent pricing adjustments, it's actually not that bad. Um, and this is one hundred and fifty thousand, so it's kind of sitting right in the middle of it. But yet the speed <clears throat> and the top speeds only. And I say only because no one's going to drive. Well, you're not supposed to drive 155 miles an hour on the road, but its top speed is limited or, or at 155, where the other ones, I think, can go over 200. Um, but you can buy a Model S Plaid that's 90,000 mm-hmm. and has a top speed of 200 from yep. a 0 to 60 of 1.9. Yeah. I mean, that's just breathtaking numbers uh, out of uh, out of that vehicle. And I've still not set in one. I, I know we have a few people in, around town that have it, and I've been asked if I want to go drive it. I've just not had the opportunity. But um, uh, so, yeah, you're taking on the best. You're taking on the biggest in that industry. And, you know, good. it, it, it doesn't quite come up. Now, I have a picture of it, and, and you can see it here. It looks good. It looks very good. Uh, Lotus has always had – um, very good styling. Um, I prefer the Pina, Pinaferina uh, designs. Wish they would kind of pull some of those. I know that there's some inspiration there they've worked on in the past, but um, uh, you can kind of see the Lotus brand in the design. Uh, looks great. I mean, it. I would love to have one at a hundred. If I had 150 thousand, would I rather have the look of that one or look of the plaid? I would probably rather have the Lotus from a look standpoint. And that might be the other thing here. When I'm driving a Plaid, there's really no difference between it on the street driving by me and somebody's Model S. Yes, we know it's quicker, but everybody else is going to like it. So, okay, it's a Tesla. Uh, You see this thing, and you're going to know that it's something special. And, you know, you have that Lotus logo, that that green and yellow logo that is very um, prominent in the racing industry. So, I like it. I don't think I would pay that kind of money for it, um, but I, I really like the look of it, and I think that they're going in the right direction. They've not really had a lot of uh, home runs in the uh, in 
for the competitors they've had, they've built, they still look great, but, uh, you know, I hope they do very well with it. It is going to have DC fast charging up to 350, So it is the same as the model S or I'm sorry, the, uh, uh, lucid air Sapphire. Do you know what the max charge is for Tesla? Can you get 350 out of it or is it limited at 250? Yeah, we have to research that. Yeah, so you're looking at 93 miles of range in five minutes. So if you, but that's obviously if you have the right charging unit that can output that much power. But if you had that car and you did charge it five minutes for 100 miles, I mean, now you're getting to where you can hook it up, go to the restroom, come back, and in 15 minutes you've got 300 mile range if you if you did that. So. Um, when it comes to range, it did not give exactly what it is, but it does have a two-speed transmission and a 102 uh, kilowatt battery. So uh, with a 5,500-pound curb weight, though, now that's heavy, really heavy for Lotus. Um, they've always been very lightweight vehicles using carbon fiber and all these other things. So 5,500 pounds is, uh, is a huge amount of weight uh, for that vehicle. Uh, but they think between the mileage, or I'm sorry, the, the size of the battery and the weight, you're probably going to be able to go 350 miles on it. But uh, again, um, 150,000, you know, it's, it's, I like it. I don't think I would spend that for it. Um, but I'm glad that they're in the market because they've always had really good handling vehicles. I can't wait to come, they create a really good racing series out of these because you have it in formula e you also have it in uh rally e um rally cross so um love to see some oval track and some road course for the evs as well uh next week let's we'll probably get into the dodge hellcat we've not talked about it this would be the replacement of the hellcat uh elephant engine and the um hellcat engine uh probably the best uh uh, the best uh, motor that's been put in vehicles in the last 30 years is that uh, Hellcat 707 horsepower uh, monster that they put in everything. Um, looks like this is the last year for it. Um, and then you could get the Elephant. I, I don't remember how many horsepower it was. I think the Red Eye um, was even higher than that in the 800 range. Uh, Ford and and Dodge kept going back and forth with the with their numbers and I saw the other day a the F-150 this would be the 500 so it's the V8 version of the Raptor go up against a um, T-Rex and honestly I thought because you know you don't have much horsepower difference but I honestly thought that the T-Rex was going to be quicker and sure enough if, if it didn't uh, lose uh, again at their that was just what I seen. It, there might have been starts, or I don't know if it was how fair it was, but um, I guess because it's so much lighter at using aluminum and some other things. Um, I've got to ride. I, I, got, I was able to drive one of the T Rexes, and it is a monster. I love love the way they drive. Uh, love the sound of that supercharger. Why the gas power truck? They're pretty bad, eh? They're they're really really good. So, um, but I uh, don't know why I got off on that. But uh, oh, because of Dodge. And uh, but yeah, so we'll talk about that one. Obviously, it looks they got that sound. They they have artificial sound being pumped through the exhaust. I don't I, I don't I'm not into that. I think it's like putting a sock, you know, somewhere to say, look, this, you know, it, it's fake. And and if you're going to do this, you just go ahead and say, look, it's fake, and uh, don't worry about the sound because it's the sound that it makes now that that you know. Uh, I'm not into that. So, uh, but we'll talk about that vehicle. Uh, we may have a, uh, somebody on the show next week. Um, and then obviously we'll bring you all the whatever news and uh, that's happened over the past seven days and uh, kind of get into that as well. Hopefully, Josh will be back at that point too. I'll be back. Anything I'll be back. else? That'd be that good. All right. Well, good that good is good everything of this last week um as always if you have any questions or concerns just send it to us um and this has been another episode of turn down for what